Today we are building these. Also we'll have a look at a new machine from Mingda. Today's theme is Outward Simplicity, a defining trait of the Magician X from Mingda. At least, that's the sentiment I gather from the PDF they sent. If there was a problem, yo, I'll solve it. And it's apparent right from the start with this one step assembly, which is further broken down into these four sub-steps, which are further broken down into these bunch of illustrations. But really, they just want you to stick this onto here, a couple of M5 screws from beneath, a couple of M4 screws from the sides, this will totally hold a roll of toilet paper, snap in a few harnesses, and she's about done. Yep, I just decided it's a she. Now, check out this box. It's a clever use of some otherwise vacant space, and it'll store all the little odds and ends that came with the machine. So, let me just flip it on, and since this is a pre-production model, I have some firmware to update. Never a bad idea to do that anyhow. When it's done, we are up to date as of this recording and the machine is ready to print. So let's cut to the fancy motion control pan. The Magician X features an impressively responsive 3.5 inch color touchscreen, a 230 by 230 millimeter third generation silicon carbide glass build plate, a direct drive dual gear extruder, and a pair of Z axis motors with the lead screws locked instead by way of a timing belt. Coming back to our theme of outward simplicity, you'll find no adjustment knobs under the build plate. Instead, the machine performs a quick 16-point mesh leveling routine directly from the home screen, though you can still evoke it with a G29 command if you're so inclined. Anyhow, that is the printer. Simple to assemble, simple to operate, just plain simple. Now let's talk about the project, and the simplest design I could think to feature, short of a sealed box, is a passive radiator tune base reflex. I like your funny words, magic man. A mouthful, to be sure, but it's just a volume of air suspended between an active and a passive membrane. Tuning is achieved by varying the shape of the chamber, its volume, the orientation of the components, and the physical properties of the radiator. So, playing the role of our active membranes will be this matched pair of drivers from Foundtech, and complementing them will be a set of these 3 inch passive radiators from Dayton Audio. After a fair bit of drafting, what I came up with is this mini studio monitor, optimized for efficient loading between the membranes on the inside and a minimally obtrusive diffraction lobe on the outside. The final design measures 250 mm in height and fits comfortably on a 230 by 230 mm platform. Theoretically, it is small enough to print in one piece as it does fit the build volume, though given that we cannot print in mid-air, not without a sh ton of support anyhow, it'll come together as a pair of half shells using the tried and true tongue and groove joint. Performance-wise, I'm shooting for an extended base shelf response, something that we can DSP correct with a single shallow Q filter. Ultimately, the simpler we make the correction curve, the fewer issues we experience in the time domain, which is important in a studio monitor. Though, as I currently have no way of testing passive radiators, this response prediction relies on the accuracy of the parameters listed by Dayton, and I have yet to establish whether or not they account for the mass of the included hardware. For now, let's get this machine doing stuff, and just to ensure that everything works, I decided to fire off a test print. Here's a small bundle of PLA that came with the unit, and here's the brim around the 3D bench, giving me a chance to baby step the vertical offset. It looks a bit lumpy, as it would since I did use the entirety of it to dial in the Z height. A few layers in, however, things appear to be on track. I did notice the machine having some minor trouble with the overhangs, and there's this weird horizontal banding pattern visible along the otherwise smooth curvature of the hull. For all intents and purposes, however, the machine does work, so let's get things ready for the feature build. Here's one of the half shells in Cura, along with some modifications that I made to the factory PLA Plus profile you saw me use for the 3D Benchy. Right away, the infill density is brought up to 40%, gyroid pattern, retraction is enabled with each layer change and before moving onto the outer walls. We also have to generate support for the overhangs, one for the lip just above the terminal plate, and one for each of the two protrusions formed by the inset mounting holes. The same profile is used to slice the other half shell, and if you'll notice, each is projected to take just over two days to complete. So, let us finally crack into some of this true blue PLA from Hatchbox, 
load up the machine. And away we go! Print from SD card, mini monitor, lower half. This is the screen that I'll be looking at for the next several days, eventually, because it would appear that this isn't quite the set it and forget it solution it endeavors to be. As you can see, we've lost our Z axis calibration. What's more, after baby stepping the nozzle back down to an appropriate layer height, the filament refused to adhere. I'll spare you the ensuing trial and error, though in the end I discovered that if I raise the print bed temperature to around 80 degrees and reduce the nozzle clearance almost to the point of contact, it'll stick. Not without forming a few ripples, though even by the second layer things begin to look alright. And even more so by the time we get to the infill. However, about a third of the way in, that horizontal banding pattern becomes quite pronounced. And after I shot this angle, I noticed one of the edges beginning to lift. Well, that sucks, but with 26 plus hours already invested into the print, may as well write it out. After all, no matter the outcome, I still have a story to tell. So, another 26 hours later, the machine lays down the final layer, and there it is. One incontrovertibly stripe-ridden half-shell. It looks almost as though the lead screws were somehow lopsided with each stripe representing one full rotation, an oscillating layer shift, if you will. Which is kind of a shame, because in every other way, the print does appear to be alright. Getting it off the build plate was no trouble at all, and the underside has that nice glossy texture, complete with logo, here's where the print lifted, here's the brim coming off, and here's the first sign of trouble with the stripes. You see when printed correctly, these supports are meant to peel away without effort. However, shifting layers also means shifting clearance, inadvertently fusing the supports to the model. I managed to pry this one loose, but the internal ones simply wouldn't budge. I mean, this is me essentially nipping at the print. Needless to say, after some time I elected just to leave the other one fused. In all fairness, however, I did share my findings with the support team before starting on the other half. They in turn suggested some rudimentary checks, making sure the platform doesn't wobble, making sure the rollers aren't spinning in place, making sure the extruder carriage has a firm grip on the crossbar. I also checked the lead screws on the off chance that something came loose, I made certain that there's proper tension on all the belts, I cleaned and re-auto leveled the print bed, and finally I re-sliced the model with the filament flow reduced to 90%. Evidently that is not something that can be adjusted mid-print. Anyway, here we go with the upper half of the first enclosure, and once again we have lost our calibration. This time with the nozzle literally scraping against the build plate as I scramble to baby step the Z offset. Beyond that, however, things quickly revert to normal with the second layer covering up the mess of the first. A glimmer of hope as we lay down some infill and then it's right back to the vertical stripes evidently. What's more, despite the freshly cleaned and re-leveled 80 degree print surface, the model has once again detached, in the exact same manner, in the exact same spot, though I'm still inclined to let it ride as I did with the lower half. This also means that it's about time to load in some more filament, and to the machine's credit that part is simple as well. We hit pause the extruder parks, we retract the old filament, change spools, feed in the new filament, and off we go. At this point I'm just going to wish it well and leave it be, realizing that with all the noise on the z-axis it still remains to be seen whether or not the tongue will even fit into the groove. Not leaving that to chance, however, I set out to print the other enclosure on a different machine. As you probably already know, these videos are as much about the project as they are about me reviewing stuff. I'm also interested to see if maybe something about this gyro jitter may be causing the alignment to scatter on any machine, not just the magician. So let's call this the reference print and we'll come back to it later. In the meantime, it looks like the upper half of the first enclosure is finished. Once again, it pops off quite easily, especially given the fact that it had already partially lifted, though I'm still not seeing any major warping along the underside. Overall, the print quality is on par with the lower half, so now let's see if the interlocking bits retained enough clearance to make this hole. And they have! Ironically, all these shifted layers actually camouflage the merge line. Anyhow, for some finishing work, smoothing the edges and so forth, I'll hand this off to Sophie. Now, there's probably going to be a handful of people in the comments wanting to know, what is it that you have there? 
This is a pretty generic run-of-the-mill nail drill for like manicures and stuff. It's kind of bottom of the line, relatively inexpensive. It is a Melody Susie brand. Hashtag not spawn. Joke. It actually does really good though. Since it's got an adjustable speed on it, I can dial it in just right that I don't damage the side and still manage to scrape off all that little excess in the elephant foot. And once all the jagged remains of the brim are filed down, we move on to the electrical stuff. By the way, check this gadget out. Four leads all at once. And now we're all focused on that one out of place strand. Anyway, here's the binding post going in, some soldering work, and finally the two halves come together with a generous helping of the epoxy spread across the groove then held in place with some ratchet bars. At this point, the enclosure is done, now it's just a matter of loading in the driver. And yeah, we are definitely going to need some blue tack over here. I don't think I've mentioned just how rough the surface is to the touch. With the driver in place, we can come around the back. And before we close this up for good, I still need to figure out if the passive radiator should be installed with or without these little doodads. So, for ease of access, I'll just stick it on like this and run a series of frequency sweeps to establish the effects of the added mass. Right away, here it is with nothing attached to the radiator. As you can see, the two curves track reasonably well. The saddle in the base region is slightly deeper than what I had predicted. It also doesn't reach quite as low, but now let's see what happens when we increase the moving mass. By the way, the length of this screw is such that additional weighted objects can be fastened behind the washer, but it's also long enough to protrude into the dust cap if no such object is needed as you'll see in just a moment. And, as luck would have it, the weight of just the screw and the washer is already enough to extend the response down to, if not past my projection. So there is our target moving mass. Now it's just a matter of mounting the radiator the right way around. And here you'll notice a completely uncensored nipple formed by the screw protruding from behind. Does that arouse anyone down there? It means that we're just about done. Though before I cut to the sound demo, a few words about the machine. It's not quite there, is it? The auto-leveling feature doesn't exactly eliminate the need for manual adjustment knobs, it simply replaces them with the need to manually baby step the Z-offset with each new print. The build plate doesn't stick, even with the temperature cranked up to 80 degrees, and then there's the glaring issue of print quality. Needless to say, I expect that some fundamental changes are underway for the production version of this machine, and I wouldn't necessarily write it off strictly based on what you've seen here. Anyhow, that's the review out of the way, now let's come back to our reference print, which, as you can see, completed free of any weird artifacts on the z-axis. The process of putting it together was no different from the first enclosure, and once I got them both wired in for tuning, a brief RTA session with the Mini DSP 2x4 produced a reasonably flat response down to around 40Hz by way of nothing more than a saddle created by a single high shelf and a single low shelf filter. More to the point, these are all set to play, so now would be a good time to reach for those analytical headphones. As always, I look forward to comments describing your listening experience as well as your choice of audio gear. Speaking of which, today's voiceover was recorded on the Maono AUPM500, easily the warmest, least sibilant of my large diaphragm condensers. I didn't even have to apply a de -esser over this recording. Anyhow, don't forget to rate the video as you see fit, subscribe for more, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers! Okay, recording, right. Left music.